Thank you. Um, well, thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, my name is Sonia. I have an accent because I am Peruvian. I was born in Lima, Peru, uh, in South America. Um, if you have a problem understanding my accent, tell me. I'll repeat it gladly in Spanish for you. Uh, do you have? We are. Uh, do you have an idea who indigenous peoples are? Yes, I see a big crowd today. So what, we're gonna, what I'm going to ask you to do, and then we will discuss about this. I would, I'm going to ask you to, uh, today, we're going to start a conversation drawing. Uh, so I'm going to ask you to look around you and form groups of six or seven people. Take a piece of paper, take some crayons, and you can place yourself, you can draw on the, on the walls, not on the wall, but put your, your paper on the wall, <laughs> but, or on the floor, or on the table. Please move, be creative. Uh, I'm not a, this is not an art class, so if you just do a circle and a stick, that's fine with me. I'm not grading anybody for your artistic skills. Uh, what I want to know, and this is going to be your task, okay? So I'm, maybe I should make the groups, because we are a big crowd today. Um, what I am going to do is I am going to ask you to draw an, ind an indigenous person. Whatever comes to your mind, all right? That's the question. There is freedom to do whatever, be as colorful, as creative, whatever it is. What I am asking you to do is talk in your, in your group and make a decision on how you're going to portray an indigenous person, all right? So, I'm going to make groups of seven, OK? So uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Is that OK? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So that's a different group, yes? One, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. That's another group. One, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. You're another group. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's another group, OK? Please stand up and get one piece of paper and your crayons. And we have 10 minutes. So, you, so what can we say? What, what can we say about indigenous people? Based on our drawings, thank you. Based on our drawings, what can we say about indigenous people? Native Americans. Native Americans, just ideas that come, yes. There is one group, one image, one similar image. Okay. What else? Yes. The indigenous people are relics of the past. They are relics of the past. What else? Close to the land. The close to the land. What else? Spiritual. They're spiritual. All right. You're good. What else? They all live they live of the, ma the land and they are simple. simple. You say that they don't need much. Yeah. So can you say that they are not greedy? Okay, they are not greedy. Somebody said something. Down. 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 
Earth. To Earth. What do they mean? Like they're more connected with Mother Nature, I guess you could say. They're connected to Mother Nature. Yes. Um, portrayed as like primitive. They are portrayed as primitive. What does that mean? Like they, like the basic, like instinct, like they go on like the instinct, like the necessity is what man needs along with. Instinct versus what? If I, I go for my instincts, I am not going for... Like your wants, your needs versus your wants more, like I don't know. Uh -huh. more, more, less logical, more yeah. for, forward in your instincts, yes. They are not materialistic, all right? Who, how many of you came today saying, I don't know anything about indigenous people, <laughs> right? And we know a lot about indigenous people. So what I'm going to talk today is where did this information come from? And how is this built? I mean, where do, we where do we know all this if we don't know anything about indigenous people? That's the topic of today, yes? And we are going to, if you allow me to, I would like to build upon what you just said and start analyzing what is it that we Westerners know about indigenous people and how it is constructed. That's the topic of today. My name is Sonia Lindop. I am an anthropologist. I have worked with several indigenous peoples of Latin America. I lived in Mexico. I traveled you know, a lot in Peru and in Ecuador. Um, and I have worked with many indigenous peoples. And one of the things that I encounter, and the reason why I decided to study this more in depth, is that people react to indigenous people in the funniest way, in the weirdest way. Why, why will these Americans who come when I was working in NGOs, I was wondering why would these Americans think about indigenous people in that way? And why do they know what they know? What do they think? Why do they think what they think? And this is what I'm going to show you today is kind of the answer that I found of that question. Um, I'm going to take this out because I would like to start with a PowerPoint presentation. Please interrupt any time. This is not a formal, uh, you know, Yes, please. I am supposed to turn this on with this. You hold it? No, it's on. It's just takes it's on. It's okay. All right. Oh, what a pity. Let's move it a little bit aside only. Oh, okay. It is because I, I find a lot of these elements, like, anyway. I really like your drawings, guys. That's what I'm trying to say. Here. There. So I am going to talk about how the idea of the Indian is built as an antithesis of the West. And we will talk about it. What does this mean? So first of all, I would like to talk about what is the difference between an Indian and an indigenous person. I am going to use, during this time today, I am going to use the word Indian to refer to those ideas that the West has about indigenous peoples of um, America. And I am going to use indigenous person in reference to the existing native population of America. Indigenous peoples are basically, or Indians and indigenous are essentially the same subject. It's the person who lived in America, actually, in the case of Latin America, I'm not going to talk about indigenous globally, but my, my examples are going to be referring to Latin America, are the people who lived in America before the colonial system started, before the English came to North America before the Spanish or the Portuguese arrived in South America or Central America. And the reason, this is not arbitrary, indigenous people call themselves indigenous, while the Indian refers more to the stereotype that we as Westerners create about that subject. However, Indians and indigenous peoples are portrayed always using the same representational paradigm. The same group of ideas and values are used to represent what we call indigenous or Indians, just the same. And that's the topic of my conversation today. 
Uh, I, the, the distinction is important for me because the Indian refers to those ideas that we have that is different sometimes, and ma many times, different of the realities of indigenous peoples today, existent today. So, the indigenous people. I want you to see that a lot of your drawings has feathers on it, has makeup on it, has bows and arrows, and it's always in nature, right? Somebody was saying nature, they have an, a, a close relationship with nature. If you look at your, at your drawings, <coughs> you will see that always the landscape, the mountains, the jungles, becomes really important in the representation of indigenous people. Because it establishes a physical, but at the same time symbolical boundary that separates two worlds. It establishes a dichotomy between the modern industrial world, us, and wilderness. But it, oh, this aspect of, the, of this representation also establishes an opposition between what is modern, right, and, with, and what is archaic, what is urban and what is uh, rural, what is civilized and what is primitive, what is safe and what is unsafe, what is culture and what is nature. Do you recognize some of the things that we just talked about? Right? This comes, this, this Characteristics are in our minds that se help us separate. This is what is civilized. This is what is primitive. This is what is safe. This is unsafe. Based on these elements in the stereotype, it helps us make these different the differentiations. Combine images of wilderness and naturalness with this timelessness. Now, somebody was mentioning an object of the past. There are people of the past, right? If you combine the idea of wilderness with this timelessness, this, this, this idea supports the construction of an image of indigenous people as living in an Edenic paradise, right? An evocation of sublime landscapes, the spectacle, the spectacle of the nudity. I didn't put any nudes, they, I was not sure about my audience, but there usually you think about people very uh, light in clothes, let's say, right? Because that's part of the stereotype. They live closer to nature, so why do we need clothes, right? And there is the recreation of an indigenous, harmonious relationship with nature. All these evokes and portraits an innocent, innocent pristine, and Edenic existence before the corrupting influence of the West. This naturalness of the Indian establishes the notion of a close relationship between indigenous people and nature, and establishes that that relationship is a spiritual one. If you look, I was looking at this, for example, on how indigenous people, there is always elements of spirituality in the, in the representation of the Indian. Um, this aspect of this representation portraits indigenous people or the Indian as keepers of an esoteric or mystical knowledge, right? That is at risk of disappearing in the world today. So it recreates the idea of the, an ex the existence of this ancestral knowledge or wisdom among indigenous people. I am not, and I want to be very clear, I am not talking about, I'm not saying indigenous people don't have knowledge. What I'm saying is that the stereotype reduces the a whole, how many, the, we are talking about 40 million people that qualifies as indigenous people only in Latin America. And we, this stereotype reduces these 40 million people into few characteristics. Those are the characteristics of the, of the stereotype that we are reviewing today. So we say all indigenous people, all Indians, have this wisdom or this knowledge, right? So closely, I don't know how many of you have, you know, have seen this,
but closely linked to the idea of the Indian living in harmony with nature. And is the world of the Indian saturated with these mysterious invisible forces? You know, Pocahontas communicating with the deer, or the stars going around, and the eagle telling in dreams your future. You know, you know how, many, how many people have seen that? How many times have we seen that, right? So the Indian spirituality is labeled as magic. And it reinforces two, two main ideas. One is that the magic, hallucinations, interpretations of dreams, and the bear, brother bear talking to you, and things like that, belongs to the world of fantasy and not to reality. In Western societies, children are expected to believe in fantasy. Then this representation reinforces the idea that the Indian is naive, that is an, somehow un, unable to reach abstract thinking. That like children, they are not really responsible, nor are fully grown in, in, or matured. And in practice, this view leads to the infantilization in the Western indigenous relationship. You don't give power, you don't, you, in the same way, you don't let a child decide, decide what school they are, if they go to school or not. In the same way, you don't let indigenous people make decisions because there is this idea that they are somehow not fully grown up, right? A second aspect or a second consequence of having this magical world is that it also, if you see it in a positive way, let's say, it is also recogni it recognizes a deep wisdom, our knowledge about the natural environment that is embedded equally in the indigenous cultures. And sometimes that constitutes a very desirable knowledge. How many times have you heard, oh, we're losing the people of the Amazon and they know the cure of cancer? the cure of all these diseases that we don't know how to cure, but they do somehow because of their close relationship with nature. So what we need to do is protect them so the West can learn from them. And I'm not saying there is no knowledge. Please don't misunderstand. What I'm saying is that the stereotype, the stereotype says everybody has it. So who is indigenous people and who is not? You know, the, those who qualify as indigenous people then have to know, are expected to have all this wisdom. Yes? So, summarizing, I'm, I'm rushing a little bit through this, but if you have any questions later, we can discuss it. So then what we're saying is that the wise Indian, the good Indian, is the traditional Indian. Is the Indian with feathers, with makeup, lighting clothes, spiritual, shamanic, with shamanic knowledge, right? Those who live in harmony with nature and are the keeper, keepers of ancient knowledge. The wise Indian is also living in rural areas and they're wearing the traditional clothes. If you look at all your pictures, they're always in a different, they're not in a city. They're always in a mountain, they're always in a jungle, right? And so the pure Indian, the, the wise Indian, the good Indian is always the Indian that we have idealized, right? And let me quote Stuart Hall, I don't know if you've heard about him, argues, and let me quote him here, that stable cultures require things to stay in their appointed place. Symbolic boundaries keep the categories pure, giving culture their unique meaning and identity. What unsettles culture is matter out of place. So what do these mean, matter out of place? In opposition to the urban Indian, to the, in opposition, the urban Indian the acculturated Indian, the Indian that is not in the landscape in harmony with nature, but is crossing, taking a bus, taking a taxi in front of a computer. Those are not the real Indians, right? 
The and then all these negative aspects of the stereotype comes to our minds. They are being closed, they are placed in our minds less in the wise Indian place, but more closer to the poor in, the ur in, in urban centers. The urban Indian is then represented using the negative aspect of the representation. It's savage, it's irrational, it's primitive, as somebody was saying over there. It's irrational, it's violent, it's ignorant, it's dangerous. Right? If you cross somebody like this in the streets, you're not going to be you know, feeling very comfortable because all these images come to your mind. Right? They're lazy. So, the power that this aspect of the representation has is explained by Chapin. And let me quote him here. Who is interested in saving the culture of the marginalized people? What is the value of the traditional ecological knowledge of the poor? Poor people don't have knowledge in our minds, right? Indigenous people has it. Poor people are not wise or in harmony with anything. Indigenous peoples are. So those who are not in the landscape, you know, with their magic and their feathers and their makeup, and instead are in urban areas, facing poverty, are not really wise. They are more viewed by these negative aspects. And they are literally people with no value. So the dominant portrait of indigenous culture as traditional cultures reinforces two claims. The first one is that the indigenous world is presented as unchanged and is static in time. When we think on our culture, when we think on ourselves, we think on progress, right? A lot of us do. On how we are advancing in time, mostly with technology. Progress and techno like technological advancement is what makes us civilized and modern. And we're always improving, right, in this advance for progress. The Indian world is presented as unchanged and static. They're like suspended in time, right? And the Indian is also presented in living in a, difficult, in a different historical moment. They are somehow living in a different time. There is a different history. We are disconnected. They are not living in isolation. They are living in isolation, and not, we, we are viewing them as isolated and not in connection with the rest of the world. So the representation of indigenous culture as unchanged through times dismisses all the dynamism and the agency that indigenous cultures today have to adapt to the new circumstances, just as we all do. We all change through times, and so does indigenous cultures. So they are not just suspended in a cloud of timeless you know, harmony with nature. They are every day, you know, young guys like you guys argue with their traditional uh, you know, with those who, who push for traditional ways to say, no, we need to change our traditions to adapt to the new requirements of the modern world. So there is also a always a negotiation between indigenous people, you know, mostly between young people who say, no, we have to adapt this, and the elders saying, well, we have to protect our culture. And there is this constant negotiation. And when we think on them as suspended in time, it dismisses all these experiences. I think one of the most the important part of this stereotype is that it denies the fact that indigenous people live in our same historical moment under the mode of poverty and under development. Because these are not really indigenous people. And they're just poor. Indigenous are those who are living, you know, somewhere with their magic and their feathers. So today I'm going to reflect a little bit about why do we talk about this? Why do we care about this? Right? What is a stereotype and what do we care? 
When we talk about a discursive subject, I don't know if this is something that sounds familiar to you, but when we, our culture, the West, has a way to represent subjects. And this is information that, you know, it, it, these representations builds a, a group of information that becomes our knowledge about people. It gives us ideas, values, but also emotions. It's not just an idea, it's, it, it's you know, you, you feel things, you, you give value to things and about who indigenous peoples are and explains why and how they are different from us. So it gives us the discursive resources or gives us these ideas of what is thinkable about indigenous people or about the Indian and, what is, and a way to talk about it, right? All these ideas that we, are, we share in common. And all these ideas are not thought as, oh, I learned it somewhere else. It's, called, it's referred to as common sense. We all know that, that's obvious. That's not knowledge, right? That's the way it is, because it makes sense. But it is not, you know, it's not a reflection of reality. It's ideas that have been built by our culture to explain somebody who is different. How do these ideas spread? Where have you seen all these ideas? Movies? What else? TV shows? TV shows? History books? History books. History books in education, that's absolutely. Massachusetts the state flag. The state, exactly. The flags. Sports teams. Sport teams. Art. Art. Look at all these places, and they all. Sorry? Gift shops, yeah, how many times? TV advertising, you know, magazines, websites. We've seen this many times, right? And even though each, each movie has a different way to talk about indigenous people, or the magazines, or the advertisings, and so on, there is a common agreement about who indigenous peoples are. They are represented in the same way. Stuart Hall, call that the regime of representation. That means that there is a similar way to represent indigenous, the Indian, regardless of the media that is being, uh, you know, that is making the, the, the portrait. So in that way, so we're, we're gonna talk about how, how is it that we're gonna go a little deeper about this, this idea of stereotype. The stereotype is built using a, a binary structure. I don't know if you've seen this painting, but this is called the good and the bad Indian, right? And the stereotype has two aspects of it, a negative and a positive aspect. So the negative aspect of the representation builds the idea of an Indian in terms of its deficiencies according to the Western standard. It builds the idea of the Indian as an inferior other. We have notions of the ignoble savage, the bad Indian, the ignorant Indian, and usually it's portrayed using characteristics as violent, extremely cruel, barbarous, liars, civil, uncivilized, and domesticated, ignorant, and the list can go on. So there is, the, the stereotype has these two aspects at the same time, right? The stereotypes tell us the Indians can be or this side or this other. Or it can be the negative sides of the Indian or the positive side of the Indian. While in the negative side, uh, the Indian is violent, is, is, you know, nude, is lazy, is irrational, the positive Indian represents the Indian as a superior other. As, I don't know if you heard about the phrase, the noble savage, right? That was used in the 18th century. This, by the way, this, this binary structure has been used since the discovery of, of, of the Americas. How, when people start to, de, to explain who are these people in America? How can we explain the, the existence of all, all these natives? So immediately, 
the, Euro the European at the time and the West in general start creating these two sides. Oh no, they live in an, in an Edenic life. Oh no, they are primitive. Sorry, they are primitive and they live in an Edenic side, in an Edenic uh, side, right? So based on this, we talk about an indigenous that is living in harmony with nature, that is generous, that is not greedy, as somebody was saying, selfless, innocent, unable to lie, physical and spiritually healthy, free of social conventions. I've seen in Facebook even a post that said, you know, how Indians don't have credit cards and they are free, right? <laughs> so everybody has their own idea of freedom. But, so they're wise and knowledge because they don't use their credit card. Um, so that's the positive side of the representation. And it recreates the idea of a good Indian. But this representation, these images are just not images that are in your head or in your head. The important is not just having images in people's heads. The important, the important aspect of this is that we share as a group all these ideas. The stereotype, the stereotype of the Indian then provides a, us as a group the resources to talk about and to think about the Indians. And marks a range of possibilities available to us as individuals to position ourselves within this range. What I mean by this is that we represent the Indian, as we talked in the, at the beginning, as a mirror of the West, right? But it gives us a, a, a different, a range of different possibilities. And let me explain this. When you, the, in the West, there, our view of modernity and civilization is, is, uh, is, it has an oppositional relationship to the representation of the Indian. So for, let me explain. When those peoples who see your own society as a civilization and, and modern, you know, we are living in culture, we have a social order that is fair and just, that there is a morality, the industrial and technological advancement and development is bringing us to progress. People who are closer to believe these kinds of ideas tend to see the indigenous peoples as the opposite. They are ignorant, they are primitive, they are violent, because we are a representing progress. In the other side of the range, when you have among Westerners people who see their own society or critique their own society as somehow corrupted, right? We are greedy. There is no social justice. There are, we pollute, we contaminate. So then all those who tend to think in those ways see indigenous people as a superior other because the indigenous people become the utopia, the proof that this world can change. So we expect indigenous people to become somehow an ecological Indian, an Indian that whose, who, whose blueprint in the earth is so minimum that they, they will never hurt nature, right? This is setting high expectations to say the least, for indigenous people. If you ask, nobody can be horribly bad or, or terribly good. But this is what the stereotype tells us about indigenous people. And this is the way we can measure the authenticity of indigenous people. I'm going to make uh, an example, if you allow me, to, to make you know, things clearer, hopefully make things clearer for you guys. So when we talk about Westerners who think, or who position themselves closer to these ideas of progress and technological advances, right? We are going, we went to the moon, we are able to have all these kinds of scientific advances and so on, and this is bringing to our society more justice, better health, 
better lives in general. If we are thinking in our societies in that way, what can you think about the indigenous or the Indian? This Indian is violent. This Indian is kind of primitive, right? He doesn't get it. He's still living in the past. So what is the relationship that is established by these ideas is that the West somehow has the responsibility to help this guy catch up to modernity. We have to take them out of their primitive life into our modern world. So we bring to indigenous people, uh, territory today advancement. Yes? I feel like images of indigenous people, like that one right there, are like our efforts to show them in the past, but so not really in the present. Many indigenous so people wear really, jeans. We don't really illustrate them in the present, we illustrate them in the past, not today. Uh huh. You know, that the way they, they dress, I have encountered people who dress just like that and dress and then take their feathers and put their jeans on. <laughs> because it's, this is like putting, wearing a suit. Do you wear a suit at some point? Sometimes. Sometimes. Do you go to school in a suit? Do you go to the beach in a suit? Why would I go hunting in jeans? Right? It's the same idea. We cannot expect an, one or the other. I'm very glad you mentioned that because this image is an image of a primitive person. When in reality, but this is the stereotype, right? I'm trying to refer to these ideas that we have as a portrait in our, in our you know, mainstream uh, media. When today, indigenous people in Latin America, like in the rainforest, for example, there are many people who just don't wear any clothes because it's so hot, right? When, they, when a Westerner comes, they suddenly dress a little bit and it's mostly the Westerner who takes the clothes off because it's so hot, right? But it doesn't make sense. But if you're going to a city, as many of them do, you know, to sell something or to go to register their child to, you know, as the birth of a child or so on, they wear their jeans. And some makeup or not, it depends. It's just like wearing a suit. It's part of who, you know, there are moments when you wear some and moments where you don't. But in this stereotype, we perceive the primitive like this. We don't think indigenous people are wearing jeans, right, or a suit. I, I want to be very clear that this representation is not necessarily linked to what the reality of indigenous peoples are today. I'm trying to, to analyze the stereotype of it. So the relationship, the power relationship between the West and indigenous people is vertical and the, ver the, the West is dominant. Right? Because this is what civilization is all about. We have to help others to catch up with that. But what happens when we think on our societies as polluting? We are polluting the earth, you know, the waters are heating up, there's global warming, animals are disappearing. We as a civilization are failing. So for those people who share these values and worry about these kind of issues, then the same indigenous person will have a different value. Suddenly, this guy is the key to save Earth because they value Mother Earth, because they have knowledge that we don't have, right? Because their, their connection to their environment is so intimate that it's part of their spiritual world. So these, these Indian is an ecologic Indian. They don't kill for killing, they kill for food, not for fun or greed, as we do, right? I mean, there is a lot of other ideas that are linked to this good Indian. It becomes, when you see that the West portrayed in a negative way their own societies, then the indigenous world is portrayed in a positive way. Then the relationship between both of them changes and it becomes and it becomes the indigenous world, the utopia that we need to learn from. But who qualifies as this guy? 
And that's the big question, the who is an indigenous person and who is not an indigenous person? We, the, usually, what I have seen in my experience is that the West, or Americans in this case, just not to make it so broad, use the elements of this stereotype to define if this is or if this is not an authentic indigenous person. This guy is not really indigenous because that guy is making deals with a mining company. He cannot be indigenous. He's you know, polluting the earth. So he's not, he doesn't qualify. Or he's not wearing feathers. He's wearing jeans. He doesn't qualify. So who has the power to define this is, an America, this is an indigenous person who is doesn't, is still in the hands of the West, is still in the hands of those who define the problem, right? So who, who says you're indigenous or who's not? It's us. And how do they say it? Because you, as indigenous person, need to perform your indigeneity. You need to perform in the way I expect you to perform in order for me to recognize you as indigenous. Yes. Well, just now, the uh, Mashpee Indians have been designated a tribe by the federal government so they can have a casino in the ponds. And they had to prove for so many years that they were a tribe. Pro uh, go prove that you are an indigenous person, right? <laughs> we're here before we can. And if you think about I think the casino idea is very interesting. Because if you're an Indian, Native American, right? and I have access to casinos, I'm gonna get rich. That's the negative aspect. I'm, I'm lazy, really, but I'm gonna get so rich with the casinos, right? That they are, you know, somehow lucky because they're lazy, but they are not gonna work enough and they're gonna be millionaires suddenly because they have casinos in, in their land. Just because they were here before us. Just because they were before us, right? But that's, that is the negative side. So what would be the positive side of the Native Americans? They, they deserve it. They deserve it. Why? Because everything was taken from them. Everything is taken from them. They have been victims, right? They, they still have their cultures and we have to... When in reality, Native American, as many indigenous peoples in America, are living in a state of poverty, of deep poverty. And we don't know about the situations for reservations in the United States. What we know is about the casinos, right? Because that's what the, nom the dominant values are. Oh, these people are so greedy, they just want their casinos. If you think about, uh, the I invite you, next time you hear any issue about Native Americans or indigenous peoples, think about these two ways to portray it. And what do they mean? Who are they really supporting when they portray it like that? So let me conclude this analysis of the stereotype. Uh, saying that the representation of the Indian in the West, instead of being a reflection of reality of indigenous peoples, is a social construction that helps build notions of Western identity, who we are, based on values of modernity, technological advance, and progress, in opposition to primitivism and savagery. This representation of this stereotype builds a set of expectations about in the Indianness that becomes a measuring stick used to assess Western progress as well as to evaluate the authenticity of indigenous peoples according to how well they perform their indigeneity. And finally, the Western discourses of indigeneity validates and perpetuates a system of domination and subjugation of indigenous peoples. And I would like to conclude today and, and let you have some comments, but I would like, don't want to leave without saying something about the indigenous peoples today in Latin America. There are the, the, United, the, the UN has a working group that just passed the Declaration of Indigenous Peoples' Rights. Have you heard about it? Nobody hears about it, but they have passed the indigenous, you know, indigenous peoples have international rights today. They declare, declare in 2007, and they are still working, and they declare that all people in the world who suffer 
the system of uh, colonialism, those native populations are now indigenous peoples because they have to face similar circumstances. That means that people in Asia, people in Africa, people in every country can claim an indigenous status. Cleverly, the UN is not saying this is an indigenous person, this is not. They're leaving it very broad now. And there is another um, a, a convention, the 169 Convention uh, the, uh, of International Labor Organization, recognize the indigenous people's rights. And governments, every government, with the exception of two or three in Latin America, agreed with that convention. So those are legal rights that indigenous peoples in Latin America has. We are talking about close to 40 million people in Latin America, and they belong to close to 600 different cultures or ethnic groups. That means very different languages. It means different ways to understand the world, in different ways to understand who God is, how, you know, cultures give us a sense of what reality is, of why we are in this world and what are we supposed to do here in our time on Earth, right? This explains our world. And these are many different ways to explain the world. People who have different environments live in jungles, mountains, deserts. They have been colonized 500 years ago or 100 years ago. There is not one similar experience for these 40 million people. They are very, very different from each other. And they believe there are com commonalities and there are things that they differ to. Some of their stands to protect their environment. Some of them want oil companies to come because that's a way to make money and send their kids to school. So there is no one position or one way to be indigenous person today. 12% um, of the entire American population is indigenous and approximately 40% of them live in rural areas. One key issue today on why do we care about indigenous to begin with? Now, you're gonna hear a lot about indigenous people because indigenous lands are normally underdeveloped. And usually, it has oil, mining, water, natural resources that need, the world needs to exploit, right? So now, companies are going there and say, oh, we want your team, we need the wood, we need the water, we need, oil, we need mining, and they say, but this is our land. And they have two laws that protect them. But first, you need to qualify as indigenous people. Right? This is not just images in our heads. There are some very important implications about this. Increasing urban, the most common issues that indigenous people face is increasing urbanization. You know, the, people's, the cities grow, and they're getting into the rural areas. Resource extractions is the, big, the biggest issue among indigenous peoples today. People, a government, let's say I am Peru, and let's say you are an Achuar, right? So the oil company comes and say, I want to get oil from you. So we make a deal, you give me some percentage, you go, please go in and get some. But the Achuar said, no, this is my land, but I am the government, you have to let the oil company in. And you said, no, but I have rights. I don't recognize those rights as a government. And as an oil company, we make an alliance. So who do you think an Achuar will go to for help? Who would you go for help? NGOs, environmentalists, organizations. But these environmental organizations is asking you, you need to be in relation with nature. You need to be those who, are, who know, has wisdom, knowledge, who care about the environment so much because it's part of your culture. If you're not, then you're not indigenous. You see what I'm trying to say? The, the stereotype really defines the relationship of the West and indigenous people, with indigenous people. And finally, there is very small political participation of indigenous peoples in government. International to the local level. Uh, we can talk a lot. This is a very extensive um, 
topic, but I hope I have given you a little bit of you know, ideas of what the indigenous world is. Thank you. <laughs>